Hi folks, how's it going? I was going to do a hobby nightmares today and it's all re there ready to go and I'll do it on Tuesday. But I have come across uh, an email sent to me directly that is too perfect not to share. It is, uh, I got a lot of laughs out of it and a, a lot of tragedy out of it in terms of, you know, how things went for this person. But I think the really good intake to what goes on at Games Workshop perhaps behind the scenes and how certain managers are treated especially back in the bad old days before I even started working there so we are getting the perspective of an old timer today and when I say old timer please don't be offended it is literally somebody who's been there from the very start not the very start but like the, the mid 90s or all the way up until the present day if you like what I do the subscribe button is down below. Please click that and make sure we're getting more, more eyes on the product, more eyes on the videos. And if you do click subscribe, then please click the real, real subscribe button, which is the bell notification down to the right hand side, which literally lets you know that I'm here. If you don't do that, YouTube won't let you know that I'm doing content and you'll never see me again. I know, it's sad, but you know, it is what it is. Or maybe you don't want to see me again, then I wish you well in your future endeavors. Goodbye. So... Let's get started, shall we? Because I really want to get into this one. This is from Darren the Lost. And he says, and I did I did talk to Darren whether I could use his name. He said yes. So there we go. He says, Hey North, Darren here. Former Games Workshop manager, now running my own hobby store here in Canada. I worked in the UK for some time, 15 years to be exact. And a lot of time of that time, I was with Games Workshop in the bad old years. Years which you seem to be seeing the end of whilst you were working there. Well, in the bad years, imagine the company as you saw it, but far worse and far more cliquey than when you were there. And let me tell you guys, if it was, if it was more cliquey than when I was there, this must have been um, walking on eggshells all of the time. Darren says, I am talking from around 2002, okay, so not the 90s then, to around 2015. To be frank, I loved my job and everything about it for the first six or so years. I applied to my store whilst living with my girlfriend at the time, and those were heady days. I still remember it was November and just before Christmas. I had gotten to move in with my girl, who is Scottish, or was Scottish, and while she worked, I was essentially doing nothing and waiting for my work clearance to come through. As somebody with a, with a joint passport. Okay, so you got a joint British passport. Okay. When it did, I popped into the local games workshop nearest my flat and talked to the manager in there. I got to know him, had a laugh, and mentioned that I was looking for tips if there was any work in the shopping centre for Christmas. He asked me to submit an application to his store. I did, got the job, and came home at the start of December where I celebrated with my missus at the time. It was an amazing time, and I loved that Christmas. It was the memory that got me through the harder times as they came up later. It's always nice to like, see people go through life and then they get that one time in their life where things are going really, really, really well. What people don't seem to understand is peaks and troughs happen for everybody. You know, I never understood this for ages. Like, like I always thought that everybody else is having an amazing time, all of, or most people are having an amazing time all of the time and simply getting on with their lives. It's not the case. It's not the case. Everybody's a mess. Everybody is a mess. Everyone's going in peaks and troughs, up and down, in almost manic-like episodes in their lives. It's normal, you know? Anyway, Darren says, After that Christmas, I applied for the full-time worker red shirt position at that store and got the job, unsurprisingly. I was there for two very happy years before finally the manager moved on to bigger and better things and recommended me to replace him which I duly did. I stepped right in and things kept going well. Our profits were up year by year, but only by about 2-5%. to Games Workshop usually wants around 15 Yeah, that is true. That is true. Games Workshop wants around 10-15% growth in your store every single year. Um, which is one of the main reasons why we had such a, a come down between me and Games Workshop when I was there, because... My, my growth was something like 1% or something like that, 1% to 2%, and they were like, that's not good enough. And I would say, well, you opened another store nearby, or you let another store open nearby that sells my product at 20% off, what do you want me to do? Uh, <laughs> you know, but don't argue with them. Like, they're always right. Do not argue with them. Like, always, you know, if you want to keep your job, do not argue your side of the issue. It's not going to go very well. Anyway, Darren says, 
This was the norm in that store, as in the 2 to 5%, and actually represented a little over the growth of the previous manager. But that's when the email started. Slowly at first, I was asked to clarify certain level levels of spending within the store, why I was not selling so many core box sets since they were clear KPIs, or clear performance indicators. Yeah, if you don't know, KPIs are, are what Games Workshop use to determine whether your store is actually successful or not. It doesn't really work, but it is what it is. When I told headquarters that, to be honest, people are, are more interested in start collecting boxes and things like that than they are the Space Marine-centric starter box set, Ultramarines and Orcs at this time, the other end of the phone went silent before my rep at HQ stated, I have noted that response and will put it up for review. Whatever that means. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. I had no idea who I had annoyed or gotten under the skin of. All my training days and events had gone well, and I'd stayed under the radar, unlike some of my colleagues who were rushed out of town for not forming a close enough bond to the right people. This was a thing even back in the day. You could be the greatest manager known to man, with great profits to boot. If you did not lick the right arseholes and in the right way, you were living on borrowed time. For my part, I will admit to being a, gro a, a, a brown noser and playing the game to keep my job. I thought I was doing well. Evidently, I was not doing well enough. Jesus. Like, again, I, I'm not really sure quite how managers like this are turned away from Games Workshop on such a regular basis. Most of the stuff I get are from guys like this who are clearly heartbroken and going through some shit uh, through having to leave Games Workshop when they really didn't want to. It does affect you. It's like meeting your hero and then finding out that they're an absolute douche. Not only an absolute douche, but an absolute douche who... who pays you really terribly and then ruins off your life as you try to leave. Anyway, Darren says, I started to get visits. Random visits from Games Workshop reps in plain clothes. They would wander around and critique my performance without actually sta stating who they were or what they were there for. Man, I I've heard of that happening. The spy visits, I've heard of that happening. But it never, I, I don't think it ever happened to me because I would have seen them. You know, because you can just tell them, you can tell who they are, like, really, really at a glance, even if they're in plain clothes. But I, I heard this, this had happened before to other people back in the day. This is the first letter I've gotten where it's brought this up. Uh, they must have thought they were, incredi they were incredibly clever. But those that I didn't call out as being from headquarters, I figured out pretty quickly. If I'm standing talking to a customer and some weird, nicely dressed, bearded bloke is hanging around and listening in, it kind of gives the game away. <laughs> when my report, quote unquote, came in of my conduct from headquarters, it stated that I clearly needed more training as I was not asking the right questions of customers and it was leading to less sales. Okay, right, okay. Now, is what they're doing there strictly legal? I mean, I I'm, don't know at the time, because I was in university when you were working for Games Workshop for the most part. But, like, w is that legal? Are they allowed to come into the store and just, like, hang around and pretend that they're not who they say they are? And I guess they are, because they, they would know if that wasn't the case. Um, well, maybe the law's changed since then. I don't know. But, like, this seems really, really shady to me. Okay. Darren says... Now, I had spoken to the reps in plain clothes in the store to let them know I knew who they were. With others, I just let it be. But it still felt like they were spying on me somewhat. I felt like I could never relax even to have a cup of coffee during the day in case they picked up on that as somehow slacking. In the end, I started to take my stress home with me. My relationship with my wife-to-be was already strained, as at this point, disagreements would come up. Natural things, really with us living on top of each other, but, did, but, did, but this did not help, and we did end up arguing a lot. Slowly but surely, my dream job and situation started to morph into something al alternatively darker. Oh, Jesus, man. Yeah, I, I can only imagine, like, if you think you're being spied on the entire time, the paranoia, you'd think that you were living in, in, in an Orwell novel or something, the paranoia that that would, that would spoke within you. And to be honest with you, it does seem to me that they know what they're doing, that they know that they're causing this stress on top of you. I think they want you out of there, to be honest, and I think this is a manipulation to try and get you out the door, if I'm being honest with you. 
But um, this is not good. This is this is some dark stuff. This is some dark stuff. I never came across this in my time at Games Workshop. I will say this. I never got this bad. Yet, um, I would have trainers come in, but they would always be wearing clothes, like Warhammer clothes, like the Games Workshop t-shirts or the Warhammer t-shirts. And they would come in and throw their weight around and generally be, be douches with me. Apart from one guy who was really nice. Um, the rest of them would, would literally act like I was a bit of crap on the end of their shoe most of the, for the most part when they'd come into my store. Um, sometimes they would talk down to me in front of customers, which did wonders for the, you know, the, 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 the experience of the customers in the store, of course. And they always ended up buying something. Sarcasm. Darren continues. I had been at Games Workshop for eight years by this time, and I decided to visit Warhammer World to get things out of my system. Buy some models, have a pint, etc. I sat down at Bugman's with a colleague who had, who had left the company to manage several CEX stores, computer exchange stores, as a head of retail for that company in the northwest of England. He had been at Games Workshop for 17 years by the time he left a year, a year or so prior. I expressed my feelings to him and he nodded, understanding, and told me he felt the same way and that as soon as, as new folks are promoted at headquarters, they like to throw their weight around and test long-standing managers who are keeping the wheels turning. Getting rid of the deadwood was a phrase that came up several times in our conversation. I told him that it felt less like a test and more like a manipulation to get me out of the door, to which he nodded and simply stated that this was the reason he got the hell out, out in the end. I sipped, I sipped my beer, checked my bank balance on the way home on the train, and started to make plans. Okay. A friend of mine, Mike, back in Toronto, was a lawyer and always wanted to own a hobby store. He loved it, but, when, uh, but wanted to spread the love and had already put on several events in the local area. I emailed him that night and laid out a business plan, my expertise and a willingness to front some of the costs towards a joint project that would go, uh, that would go to a 60-40 split in terms of capital investment and of ownership, with the 60% going to him. To my amazement, the next day he, he invited me for a coffee the following week as he was going to London to, for some meetings. I headed down there and we laid out plans for a new store and hobby space, a brand new venture for us both. I was honest and said I needed around six months to get the capital together. But when I was ready, we'd sign the paperwork, buy the space and get to work. Now the hard part, telling my partner, yeah, you made a really ballsy decision here. You've literally just gone and, like, put the foundations in for a new life without even telling your partner at the time. I had done this behind her back, and at this point, I, I was totally miserable. I needed out, but I loved her, and I wanted to continue the relationship. I came out and told her I had an escape plan for us both that I would leave Games Workshop and she would come with me to Canada where we where we could start again. Okay, here's the, here's, here's where that's not going to work, man. Um, for the most part, women of value don't want to be saved. For the most part, women of value, actually, you know, if you come home to them, you say, listen, I've had this idea, right? Even if you've already got the plans in motion, just tell them you've, you've, you've just got an idea. You can always pull out the plans. You can always pull out other plans, you know, they're not set in stone yet. You can just say to her, look, I've got this idea. Um, I've got this idea for us both to go to Canada. Hear me out. Let me let me let me tell you what how this would work, right? If you're both miserable and lay it out for her. And if she doesn't want to go for it, fine, but at least then it's honest. What you've done here is that you've you've been you've been too upfront and said, I've done this and I'm doing this. Get out with me, sort of a thing. Um you kind of put her in a really bad position. And I can't really blame her for not, not wanting to go with you. Anyway, he says, She rejected this outright, stating stating, uh, me making plans showed her that my faith in the, in the relationship was not there. She's got a point. She called my dreams nonsense. That's a bitchy move. I don't like that. And I should stick with the good job that I had. Jesus, is this person blind? Are they not seeing that you're miserable? Despite her seeing my misery, okay, for years at this point, she flat out turned me down. Not on the basis of being scared to move to a new country, which I would understand, but on her lack of faith in me. Wow. Which he made very, very clear. Wow, dude. Wow, wow, wow. Maybe she's hurt when she says that, but that is a that is a tough thing to hear from someone you love. 
He says, I moved my stuff to the couch area, called off the relationship and called around for places to stay. I found one relatively cheap place and took my laptop and things over there to continue working for Games Workshop whilst on a six-month lease at the new place. Plastering on a fake smile every day whilst at work, my life was completely up in the air and exploding all around me. It was the most terrifying time of my life then or since. It kind of felt like I threw a grenade on everything, and if Mike did not come through, I essentially detonated my life for nothing. My plans, my doubts were everything and everywhere. And the HQ visits kept happening. Day by day, sleepless night after sleepless night, my resolve started to cave. By now, they'd given up all pretense, and uniformed Games Workshop people were coming to my store on a weekly basis to check out how I was running things. Wow, this is, the, this is a living hell, dude. This is a living hell. My lord. One day, around five months later, I was starting to appro approach the point where my capital was above what was needed for the new store to start. Mike was also beyond ready and had already sounded out a place to rent in Toronto and had put sounders out to get the place sorted out. He had already started to renovate it. Okay, so this guy is in on board. Cool. A trainer in Games Workshop gear headed to the store and walked in on my lunch. Un um, on my lunch break, unlocking the door and letting himself in whilst I was in the back eating a sandwich. He marched into the office and demanded to know what, what I was doing and that the shop floor was completely unattended. I told him the door was locked securely and clear signs had been posted that the store was closed for lunch and that I was, on, on, uh, that I was in the back doing exactly that, taking my 20 minute lunch break. Yes, 20 minutes. They gave us 45 officially, but to be honest, as a manager, you have too much to do to take the 45 minute lunch break. He pointed back to the shop floor and demanded that I eat my sandwich there because what if a customer needed some, needed help with something urgent and was knocking on the window? <laughs> okay. He says, I finally caved. I sat back, put my feet cross-legged on the desk in front of me, and said that they would simply have to wait until the store was open. Right now, it was closed for 20 minutes, and I was taking my legally mandated lunch break to eat. I don't even know why I did this. I hate confrontation. It sort of happened on autopilot as all the rage and anger came surging out in one go. When I was finished, I scrumpled up the subway wrapper paper and threw it into the bin when I was done. He watched me eat the whole thing. He was turning red. When I went to get up, he shifted as if to follow me out to the store floor area. I reached out, picked up my Pepsi Max slowly undid the top whilst looking at him before sighing contentedly and leaning back and, and enjoying drinking it. <laughs> Please tell me you've got a Snickers there and you're just going to start eating that as well. Um, he told me I was acting like a child and in, <laughs> and in a very unprofessional manner. I told him through a, mouth, through a mouthful of Mars bar that I was simply returning the favour, and that he still owed me a lot of interest on that front. Uh, my god, the balls. Again, I am not a genuinely witty guy. This was all adrenaline. Eventually, I finished, burped, and got up to walk into the other room before telling him, Well, since you're going to follow me in there anyway, you may as well unlock the door whilst I get things set up, before throwing the keys to him. They bounced from his chest and stomach before going to the floor, as he made no attempt to catch them. I returned to work whilst he unlocked the door on the, st on the shop floor. Greeting customers and throwing myself into the job to try and show the guy I was a good manager and his ilk were, were, were a load of morons. He left at the end of the day and asked if I could go for a coffee with him to discuss my performance. He sounded like a jilted girlfriend. I told him no. I was going home. I locked up the store and walked off. The next day, whilst I was at work, I got two official warnings from headquarters. One for not responding to the express instructions of a trainer, and the other for physically assaulting a trainer for, and get this, throwing my keys at his face. 
I was done. This was serious shit. And so I called and told them if I had done such a thing, they would have just sacked me on the spot as it's a serious offence. So clearly they didn't believe it, and but still felt the need to come after me yet again anyway over emails in a passive-aggressive way. I quit over the phone, telling them that where to find the keys and how to get my remaining pay to me for that month, hear it, uh, hearing the heavy breathing on the other end. Whoever it was, they were not happy. I closed the store and walked back to my rented place before booking a ticket to Toronto, to, to Toronto for two days hence. I walked back to my rented place, but uh, sorry, I've, I've read that bit. Um, I went back to my girlfriend's house where we had been living and took my stuff out of there too. Two days later, I was on a plane and heading home to, to stay at my parents' place whilst finding a place to live. I have never looked back until finding your channel and it all came rushing back. Thank you so much for, for providing this outlet. It has meant the world to me. If you were ever in Toronto, come and see me. Details attached for my store. I owe you a beer and a few games of 40k. Things are going really cool these days and I love the life I set up myself here. I'm married with kids and, through, and so miracles do happen. Perhaps I can even get you a model or two for the Astral Blades. Cheers North, Darren the Lost. Well, you don't need to get me any models, dude. Um, the, the story is enough. That is an amazing story of like... De detonating your own time at Games Workshop and clearing house. <laughs> that is literally... That is literally the ballsiest way I've ever seen someone quit a job. And I don't mean that in a... And everyone clap sort of way. I mean, like... The entire scenario from start to finish. Like, seeing something was wrong. And then trying to, to, to set it right. You know, trying to... Push your life in a direction... That means that it's going in the right way. That means that you're actually getting there. That you're actually making positive changes. To be honest with you, man, even if those things, that, like the mic thing, didn't work out, you're really still on the on the right track. You're still nearly there. You're still on a positive mental headspace journey. It just would have taken you a little bit longer to get there. But it worked out for you, and I'm incredibly happy that it did. The bullshit that some of you have to put up with at Games Workshop there is ridiculous. And... You know, I never had to put up with anything anywhere near as bad as this. You know, because I, I downplay my own experiences quite a lot. You know, I, I don't really like a lot of fuss. I'll tell you about them, but I won't, like, you know, go off on one too much about them. But, yeah. Um, this is uh, this is a harrowing read. So, thank you very much for sending it in. Hopefully, you can know why I'm doing Hobby Nightmares tomorrow now, not today. <laughs> but, anyway, I love you all a long time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I will speak to you tomorrow for some more hobby nightmares and maybe on wednesday too for some more hobby nightmares we'll see i've got lots to get through love your long time have a wonderful rest of your day and i'll see you tomorrow have a good one